All right, welcome back to the Biblos Network. We are so glad that you have decided to join us today. I trust that the blessing of the Lord is at work in your life. It is here in Durham, North Carolina. Many exciting things are taking place. It is a great day to be apostolic, and I trust God is being good to you where you are. And if not, then tune into Biblos and let's get your life in sync with biblical principles because God wants to bless you. He wants to pour out his favor upon you. And it is a great day for the Acts 238 church. So praise God. I'm so glad you're here. I am glad to have with us today a special guest, a friend that I was able to come into contact with. Um, I guess it's been a year, year and a half ago or so. Um, maybe a year ago, I guess about a year ago this time. Um, I have with me today Brother Stephen Gill from Anderson, Indiana. He is uh, an amazing young man. He is a a Bible scholar. Uh, he's an author, and um, I want him to come on Biblos today. I want to talk about his book. The topic is an amazing topic. I'll let him tell you about that. I want to promote his book because the world needs to hear what he has to say. So welcome, Brother Gill. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Brother Urshan. It's good to be here with you. Yes, sir. I've been looking forward to it. We've kind of played, uh, not phone tag, but text tag, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had talked to you a while back about having you on the Biblos Network because you have done research on an amazing topic that we're going to get into. Um, before we get into that, though, uh, let's hear a little bit about you. You you are in Anderson. You are there with... Um, <sighs> Pat, yeah, Pastor St. Clair. St. Clair, uh, Brother St. Clair. Yeah, precious people of God. Tell me, tell, tell the audience a little bit about your, your background. Yeah, so before I was in Anderson, I, uh, I actually grew up kind of in your neck of the woods. Uh, we, uh, I, I was born in Parkersburg, West Virginia, but I, uh, shortly after, uh, um, maybe I was, I was probably two or three years old, uh, we moved back to Indiana, and I grew up uh, just around Kokomo, Indiana there, uh, which you're certainly familiar with, uh, Kokomo's. I was actually talking to a pastor friend the other day about just all the preachers and pastors that have come out of, of Kokomo over the years. It's incredible <laughs> uh, when you think about. Um, yeah, it really yeah is. so grew up down there and and went to uh, went to high school in, in Peru, Indiana. And uh, shortly, uh, I would say maybe five or so years after I graduated high school, I moved out to Anderson. Maybe four years, I moved out here to Anderson. I was going to college at Indiana Wesleyan University. Uh, majoring in biblical studies uh, at the time, uh, graduated from there in 2018, and uh, yeah, I've been in uh, been in Anderson ever since. Hard to believe it's I'm going, I guess, seven years now. I uh, uh, seven years that I've been here in Anderson, so you know, time's flying by. Uh, yeah, I love the St. Clairs though. It's a wonderful church uh, to be a part of. Uh, I've known them. I, well, I say I've known them. They've known me my whole life. I've known them. Uh, certainly, they were our youth presidents uh, back in the day. And, uh, you know, so I've kind of felt like I've always had a connection to them in some way, but moved out here and they became my pastors and, and been rolling ever since. So the St. Clair's are great people. Um, they're revivalists. They love the kingdom of God. Um, your years in Kokomo, what were those years? What what were the years you lived there? I was in Kokomo. So it had been, I was born in 93. So dating myself here now, I just turned 30. (laughs) You're dating yourself. Yeah. I'm feeling like old man (laughs) time here. Um, let's see. I, so I would have been in Kokomo that, that area from like 97 until 2000 and, um, 2000 and maybe 14 or so, Okay, uh, would have been, uh, when I'm, when I moved, maybe 2015, um, would have been when I, when I started moving, I had a couple of apartments, uh, you know, where Greentown is, uh, oh, yeah. lived around there. Yeah. And so I, I moved to Anderson and I, I came to the church in fall of 2016. So I was in Kokomo area from, you know, 97 until then. That's amazing. Well, I, I grew up with the Gill family. Um, yeah. Scott, Sean. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. We go way back, back into my <laughs> childhood. And um, yeah, that was such a trip for me because I, I did not see, okay, I left Kokomo in 1998. So you would have been just a little guy. And yeah. um, <clears throat> I went to Fort Myers and, and pastored there. So our paths never crossed. Mm-hmm. I Years later, I'm here in Sacramento. I am at the Rock Church, Pastor Miles Young at the No Limits Conference. And I, Pastor Luke St. Clair is there. And I, I guess you were there with him. And 
Brother Young gets up and announces this book, this amazing book. I, the moment I heard the title, I went, oh, I've got to get this. And then he said, it is Brother Stephen Gill from Kokomo, Indiana. And I stopped. How many gills can there be from the Kokomo area? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, and yeah, so here I am, and I'm meeting this young man that has done this amazing research from my hometown. Um, I, you know, Kokomo is a dear place in my heart, and it has turned out a lot of preachers. Oh yeah, it's like a little apostolic hotbed. Yeah, that's that's the truth. There was a there, it was quite hopping back in the day. You know, my mom went to that uh, Lighthouse Christian Academy. I don't know if you brother Rep Rogel's uh, church oh, there. We used to play ball with them <laughs> and have all kind of great times with Lighthouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. And uh, you had full gospel there and Zion. And yeah, it was it was rocking, you know. So but yeah, I grew up grew up around there, moved out here. And um, I actually didn't go to college right out of high school. I, I worked for a while, didn't really know what I wanted uh, to do immediately. Um, went to college a little bit later, which was good for me, I think. And uh, started writing um, 2000. I guess I would have started in 2014 or 15 and then uh, uh, did that first book there in, in 16. And then just from there, I just kept going. And so now we're here we are. It's been, you know, 10 years, almost 10 years later. And Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, I see a compound bow on your wall back there. You don't yeah. happen to be a deer hunter, do you? Uh, yeah, newly minted bow hunter for sure. That's uh, oh, okay. So I had, I had gun hunted as a, as a kid and uh-huh. uh, we have a... We have a, a gentleman in our church that owns a our archery shop. And, oh my! Uh, I, you know we've got so many. We've we've just got this swarm of guys that have gotten into archery at our church uh, lately, and I I kind of caught the bug, and uh, so I went and visited with him, got fitted for a bow, and started shooting. And I just I've enjoyed it a lot. It's you know it's it's a lot of fun. So oh, that's what see you're just climbing on the on the ladder of apostolic success. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you haven't made it until you went out with a compound bow. With, that's with it, man. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly it. That's awesome. Well, that's great. I, I wanted the audience to kind of get a feel for who you were. You are a Midwestern young man and Indiana Wesleyan university is where you got your bachelor's degree and, and it's in biblical studies. Is that it? Uh, I, I did my two year degree at Indiana Wesleyan. Um, and yeah, biblical studies and Christian ministries. Okay. So tell us a little bit about this book. Um, to yeah. get what the title is an amazing title. I love the title. What's the official title of the book? Uh, the history and development of the doctrine of the Trinity, the history and development of the doctrine of the Trinity. And it's exhaustively researched. You really dive into it and you go back further than a lot of typical oneness. People will go back. You go back into uh, Platonic roots and uh, Aristotelian roots that show a little bit about where this comes from. So tell us a little bit about the book itself, where where you're coming from and how far you go back and how it kind of develops just like a synopsis of the book. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to your point, uh, so I, you know, I was blessed. Obviously, I grew up in the generation that we had access to pretty, you know, anything that David Bernard had written or, you know, Talmadge French or William Chalfont, all these, you know, uh, Brother Arnold, it just all these, you know, uh, church history writers and, and theology writers. Um, and there's so many good theology books on oneness. There's good theology books on the difference between the oneness and the Trinity. I wanted to uh, add a layer, uh, if I could, of contribution that wasn't theology based necessarily, although you, you certainly can't avoid getting into some theology with the subject matter. But I wanted to focus more on, on the actual nuts and bolts of the history of it. How, how did we even get here? And, and you're right. Um, I do start. Uh, so the book starts around really um, the 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 beginning of the book is Alexander the Great and the Persian campaign. Mm-hmm. So really, you know, fourth century BC to roughly speaking AD fourth century. So something like 800 years that's in the book. Um, and the reason for that is, is just really primarily because the more you study the subject, you know, like so many things in life, um, there's, there is more nuance to how we got to where we are in the world of Christianity with the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not as simple as Nicaea one, you know, we, we do mm-hmm. like to talk about the council of Nicaea. It was an important council. It certainly played its part, uh, but the doctrine of the Trinity didn't begin there. 
and where, of course, uh, you and I are one as Pentecostals, and so we don't, uh, we're, we're, you know, the outliers, quote unquote, in Christendom in the world because we don't subscribe to the traditional uh, presentation of the of the Godhead as one God and three persons, and so. Um, I decided to start researching more about, well, you know, we, I had heard my whole life, okay, the doctrine of the Trinity, it's got this connection to sort of this Greco-Roman ideology. Um, it's, you know, it's got roots with the apologists and Greek philosophy. So I guess my question really was, is, well, you know, where did that start and why, why did that happen? Because it's not necessarily obvious to me that anybody wakes up with the intention of creating false doctrine. You know, people don't just... Yeah. Most people aren't that, they're not that malicious, right? Yeah. You know, how am I, what, how can I create a good false doctrine and really yeah, trip people up today? Exactly. And so I, my, my, my approach to it was like, okay, well, where did, you know, all of these, these writers that I've read about, where did they get their ideas? And maybe more importantly, why did they think they were valid? And so I started to, uh, go back a little bit and really, uh, where you end up is, of course, there's all kinds of preachers, teachers, uh, writers that have talked about, you know, in in very ancient history, you know, different principles of trinities that existed. I, I didn't want to go back that far just because um, so much of that does. Number one, you can get lost in some rabbit trails, you know, you know, but more important, what I really wanted to focus on is the, this Christian trinity, this idea of God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit. Where you know where did that uh, you know where did that influence begin? And so really, you have to talk about if you're going to talk about the um, the the battle between uh, what I would say is like Judeo Christian uh, thought, Judeo Christian doctrine, and the the doctrines and theologies of the world, which at that time is is really Greek. So start with the start with the basics. Well, how did Greek thought get into the Near East? You know, how did Greek thought even make its way into Judea? Um, because we read the Old Testament, and of course, there's you know the Greek Empire existed. You know, you know, you can go back to even before the times of Darius, and mm-hmm. and there's even some research to suggest that the Philistines were were maybe from the Greek mainland. So, oh, wow, um, that they traveled from the Aegean, yeah. And so, so if that all existed, uh, why you know why was that not always a problem? You know, and and so. And uh, so, the more I researched, the more I, I, I decided I would mm-hmm. frame it around. The introduction of, of Hellenism and Greek thought into the Judean province, to the land of, of Israel, and the obviously the outcomes. You know, the the uh, you know how how does that how does that inform Christian thought? Well, you you get to a point where you you have to you have to understand that you can't really separate Christian church history from the history of Israel. You can't separate Christian church history, Christian thought from. Uh, you know, the teachings and the writings of Jewish thinkers that existed in that, you know, first century BC, second mm-hmm. century BC. Yep. And so um, the more I dug out, the more I realized that before there was ever issues over the doctrine of the Trinity, you know, this, this Christian battle with Greek thought, there was Jewish battles with Greek thought, you know, yeah. you, there was uh, writers like Ezekiel, you know, he was a, <clears throat> a, a Jewish playwright that wrote a, a text called the, uh, the Exegogy that was, uh, it was written to retell the story of Moses and and the happenings at Mount Sinai, but through Greek media, through 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 Greek uh, tradition. And so you see, uh, well, there's all kinds of examples. Moses, uh, God unseats himself from the throne and gives the the diadem and scepter to Moses. And it's, of course, none of it's biblical, but it's it, it definitely is a Greek way of thinking about these stories. Yeah, there's another one called Testament of Job that recasts Job instead of as the 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 curious sufferer, you know, the one that doesn't really understand, um, you know, why what's happened to him in life has happened to him. Mm-hmm. Instead, he's kind of recast in this this Alexandrian mold. He's he's the hero that takes on willingly these these labors, and and in doing so, he knows that he's charged with with the destruction of wickedness in the world, and that if he bears the burden rightly, that he'll be exalted. And of course, again, that's not the biblical presentation in the Bible. Job is never made to understand why he went through what he went through. Um, only that God is just, you know, and so, and he doesn't, and he certainly doesn't willingly, uh, you know, take on the task. He doesn't, of course, know, uh, what's going on at the time. And so you get this, you get all, and there's many examples. I won't go into all of them, but what you, what you come to understand is that the Jews were reframing their history. They're reframing their teaching around, uh, the media of the Greeks, around the traditions of the Greeks. And there's a story, um, about Rabbi Gamaliel, actually, in the New Testament, uh, that comes from some some uh, historical sources. It says one day he was he was bathing in the bath of Aphrodite that was situated in uh, near Jerusalem. Now, this is a historical it, account, or is this a legend? Historical, 
this is a historical account okay. that, um, well, it, historical account in the sense that it, it comes from it comes from extra biblical sources at the time. Yeah. Whether or not it happened exactly how it happened, of course, I have yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. But the the principle of the story is interesting. Gamaliel is bathing in the bath of Aphrodite, and a Greek uh, philosopher, a Greek a debater, comes and says, "You being a Jew and being a rabbi, you know what what are you doing? You know, washing in the bath of idols." And Gamaliel's response is, he says, "I didn't come into her border; she came into mine." Uh, and what, what's funny about it is that so, and then Gamaliel goes on this discourse about how it's not an idol because it's in such an irreverent place. And though, although Aphrodite ordains the bath, he's not worshiping Aphrodite; he's simply bathing. The irony of the story is that while Gamaliel is fixated on the idea of whether or not Aphrodite represents an idol, it's actually not the idol at all, but it's the bath itself that proves the influence of Greek thought and Greek culture wow. in Judea and in Jerusalem. I see that. Because yeah. you know. That the, the idea of a public bath. A public house, bath. That, that's it. The Greeks brought this in. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. It, so, so this is the definition of Hellenization here. This is the Hellenizing exactly. influence of the Greco-Roman construct coming into the Judeo mindset, the Jude the the Judaic mindset. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, exactly right. That's interesting because, and it's interesting you bring up Gamaliel. Um, Gamel is that is a Hebrew word um, for camel. So we say camel, it's Gamel, and El is God. It literally, it can be interpreted the camel of God. Um, and I've always been fascinated by uh, Gamaliel for that reason. The camel was uh, one of the great symbols of commerce in that day. Um, it was the semi-truck of that day. It was the Tesla truck of that day. So the camel is a big deal in the ancient world. It's a way of commerce. It's a... Uh, it's a method of commerce it, or or the exchange of ideas, the merchant world. So, you know, when you see Christianity come into contact with Judaism, one of the first proponents of it that softens to it among the Sanhedrin is Gamaliel. And he says, take heed what you do to these brethren. If this thing is of men, it will fail. If it is of God, take heed that you don't set yourself in opposition to God. And if it's from God, nothing will stop it. So Gamaliel was open to the interchange and that camel dynamic, you know, I, I, you know, the teaching in the scripture of it's impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. The usage of the camel, I've studied it extensively. Gamaliel, the camel of God sets in motion a man named Saul of Tarsus, Paul, who literally carries the gospel to the world. So he's carrying it to the known world. He becomes the most prolific evangelist and spreads Judeo-Christianism throughout the known world at that time. Um, so this idea of exchange and going and evangelizing and spreading um, the interchange of Greco-Roman thought into Judaic thought, the interchange of ideas, how things emerge from that, there's an interchange here. There's a connection yeah. here. And yeah. And it's funny you bring up Paul because, you know, so I, I personally am of the, of the belief. I just, as, as times went on and I've studied the subject matter, I'm personally of the belief that the principles of the doctrine of the Trinity uh, were probably creeping in to the Gentile communities as early as the first century when Paul was teaching. And I have a couple of reasons for why I believe that, but one of which being so many of the of the Trinitarian thinkers that we do learn about, whether you go to a denominational school or an apostolic school, whether Justin Martyr, Tertullian. Mm -hmm. So n none of these guys that we look at had all of what became the codified doctrine of the Trinity. Right. Justin Martyr introduces the threefold, really fourfold, baptism, you know, and Tertullian is the one that uses the word Trinity, but he doesn't believe in three co-equal, consubstantial, co he believes in subordinationalism. And so, you know, you, they have different aspects of it, but not all of it together. What's interesting, though, is that when you read their writings, and I did include English translations of, of a lot of their writings in my book, especially through uh, chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8, is you find that these were men who, they were educated in the same schools that Paul was debating with at Athens and that Paul was wrestling with. You know, for example, the Epicureans and the Stoics come yes. up in Acts chapter 17. Yes. 
And when you study the Stoicism of that time, now Stoicism's had a little bit of a facelift in recent years, but the Stoicism of that time, they were materialists in the sense, not in the way that we think of materialism, like they weren't hedonists. Um, the Epicureans might have been, but the, the Stoics were, they were, they believed that all things possess form and substance. That even, even what cannot be seen with the natural eye, if it's real, it possesses corporeal form. It's called corporeal theology. And, and, when you read what Paul was saying to the Epicureans and the Stoics, and then you compare that to what Tertullian is saying to Praxius and what Justin is saying to in his dialogue with Trifo, Tertullian says something that no Trinitarian thinker that I know, no no Bible believing Trinitarian thinker that I know would agree with this phrase, but he says, You, Praxius, say that God is a spirit, but would you not also say that God is a body? Now, of course, the scriptures say God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah. It doesn't say God is a body for a reason. But for Tertullian, he was educated in the school of Alexandria. He was educated in the school of the Stoics. Justin specifically cites the education that he received among the Stoics and the Platonists as being the two most dominant uh, influences in his life. And he says, thus and for this reason, I am a philosopher. You know, he he never claims to be uh, Justin never claims in his own sto- his own account of his personal conversion. He never claims to be baptized. He never claims to have received the Holy Ghost. He he says, "I'm a philosopher. I went through all these schools of philosophy. A Christian approached me with his philosophy, and and I believe Christianity to be the highest philosophy." That's wow. an exact quote. Wow. And so and so Tertullian he comes along shortly thereafter, thirty, forty, fifty years, and he's writing and he says things like, for example. The same, I find this so funny, the same man who said, what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem, and what hath the academy to do with the church, Tertullian did say that, is the same man who, coming out of the school of Alexandria, wrote to Praxius and said, God had not word from the beginning, but he did have within himself his own reason, and so reason must be regarded as the more ancient of the gods. And so... Wow. (laughs) Completely turning John 1 and 1 on its head. I mean, just a 180. Yeah, and so it's just interesting because you, so you have to hold two thoughts in your head at the same time. It's that, number one, these men, they did read writings of the New Testament, and they saw Paul's battles with the academies, and they were generally skeptical of of the, the pagan cults, and they were generally skeptical of the schools of philosophy. But also, these are men who, by the time they're writing, they weren't educated in the synagogues. They didn't have the training of a rabbi to teach them the Old Testament. So if you don't have training in the synagogues and you didn't grow up in a Jewish community and you don't have a rabbi to teach you the Old Testament, well, how are you as a Greek man go you need you need a you need an interpretive framework. Yeah. You need a tool. You need yeah. a you need a medium by which you view the scriptures. They chose the the philosophers. They chose the schools of philosophy and that and that's how they you know the old the, the New Testament for the Jews of the first century, for the disciples, for for the first century church. The New Testament was read through the framework of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. It was, they learned Jesus through Moses and the prophets. But then this later generation, after Judea is destroyed in 70 AD, that Jerusalem, the temple is destroyed, and then the Bar Kokhba revolt in 120. Yeah. You have, now you've got the Greek thinkers that are reading it from the other direction. They, they're not coming at it from the Old Testament, but they're coming at it from the academy. And so that's how, and that's how you get this, this hodgepodge of different thought that, that bursts onto the scene, the Donatists and the Monarchians and the, you know, the Sibelians, all this stuff that happens is sort of a consequence of that. And so that's amazing. That's, that is a perspective that has to be brought to bear on this topic because we're looking, you know, 2000 years into the past, people are assuming that Trinitarianism of that day is like it is today. But Tertullian is a heretic by today's standards and was excommunicated later in his life. I think he joined the Montanist, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. He was, he thought a favor with, with the Catholic movement. Yeah. So, okay. Um, people don't realize that he, his subordinationism flies in the face of modern Trinitarianism. And, and I have made the point multiple times. That is why the Trinitarian theology is unsuitable as a foundation because you first of all if you're going to claim proprietary authority you know original apostolic authority which only the apostles have that's why we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets we're not built on the foundation of tertullian um this idea that they that he could be excommunicated, he could be unseated, he could be driven into exile, or or whatever he felt falls out of favor. His doctrines are changed, so he is a part of this 
theological puzzle, but they discard much of what he says and grab a few things. Justin Martyr, they grab a few things, and they codify it and make it a part of the official dogma, and they make it one of the primary tenets, if not the primary tenet, you know, through the ages. Yeah. Um, you can't stand on that. That's not going to work. You can stand on Paul. You can stand on Peter. You can't stand on Tertullian. Um, and, you know, that argument can be made later on about Calvinism and all the, the schools of thought that then emerged through the Middle Ages. But um, there's so much to grab a hold of right here that people yeah. have got to really see this. Um, <laughs> that's a mouthful, man. You, this something, is, that, something that I always found interesting, that the more I researched, the more I, I, I came to the, the determination that the greatest contribution that Tertullian made to the Catholic Church and I'm not. I, I don't mean to. Uh, I don't want this to sound disparaging at all towards Catholics today. Uh, I do. I do know many Catholics that do not believe this way. But uh, the greatest contribution that he made to the Catholic Church at that time was actually his tractate called "Against the Jews." Hmm. And the reason why is you when and uh, without just plugging my book, I, I do hope that people go read it in his own words. Don't don't take my word for it. Read it in his own words. Um, he accused these uh, Christian thinkers that were not Trinitarian, many of them uh, certainly baptizing in Jesus' name, but also just opposed the doctrine of the Trinity principally. He accused them of having a theology that was too similar to that of the Jews. Mm. And when he writes against the Jews, he does create, and, and <clears throat> you know, a- anti-Semitism has existed uniquely as a, it is a very unique form of persecution that's existed throughout history. Yeah. And when it began in perpetuity in Rome, it, it's it's a consequence in large part of the Judean revolt between 68 and 70, but also the Bar Kokhba revolt in 120. So what a lot of people, understand the geopolitics of the first century will help you understand how we got the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, there are two reasons for that. Number one, the Judean province, if people study history, the Judean province was the first one to seriously rebel against the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. When, you know, so, so Julius Caesar uh, takes over um, uh, in the days of Cicero, and then when Octavian Augustus comes to power, he's, he's considered the first of the, of the great emperors, you know. Yes. And the, the empire is in good shape. The, 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 the crown changes hands maybe four times in a hundred years for, for that, for that window there until you get to Nero. And then after Nero, the, for the next 80 years, the throne changes hands more than eight or nine times. And then after that, it's more than 26 times in 60 years. There's destabilization that happens. Well, the question is, where did that come from? The Romans blamed it on the Jews in large, if you go back and read their writings, it had a lot less to do with their religion and a lot more to do with what happened geopolitically, they blamed the Jews for ending the Augustan dynasty. Nero was considered wow. the last of the Augustans. Wow. And and it was the revolt in Judea that caused Nero to fall out of favor with the Praetorian. He fought out of favor with the Senate because he couldn't control this tiny little province, you know, that that was was um, giving them so much trouble. And by the time they send Vespasian in, um, Judea is flipped on its head, the temple is destroyed, and it seems like it's over. And so many Jews still find religious liberty in various parts of the Roman Empire until you get to the Bar Kokhba revolt. In 120, Hadrian the Greek, Hadrian uh, the Emperor, he he is trying to Hellenize what's left of, of Jerusalem and Judea, uh, building shrines, temples, um, bringing in more theaters, things like that. The the Jews that are living in Galilee don't want they're they're not having any of it. You know they they want to fight back, and so they bring this rebellion, cause mass. Once again, chaos, destabilization for the empire. In, in order to punish them, he, Hadrian destroys. I mean, just it's considered one of the worst, uh, uh, probably one of the, one of the one of the worst um, atrocities to happen against the Jews until you get to like the days of the pogroms and the Holocaust. At five hundred thousand is the is a rough estimate of people that died. Wow. He renames he renames Judea, Syria, Palestina, or Palesheth, which is. The name that that is Syria, land of the Philistines, is how we would translate it. Wow. The name Palestine comes from 
Hadrian's decision to rename Judea after the historic enemies of Israel in order to humiliate them. Is, That's where the name comes from. I knew there was the connection, and there's been some yeah. debate on that, and secular guys will try to deny that, but I knew that there was a Palestinian-Philistine connection. The only time the word even appears in history before, is for, and I've, I've studied it, I feel like, fairly enough to know that the only time it appears before is actually, you do find the word one time in the Old Testament, but it doesn't refer to Judea. <clears throat> Palestine refers to the land of the Philistines mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Hadrian knows this, and that's why he renames the province Syria Palestine. And it's not the last name; it's, it's later renamed Diocese Orientis under Diocletian, and then it's called sort of generically the Land of Palestine. Mm -hmm. But principally, the point is, is that the Romans did despise the Jews, and yeah. that comes out in the writings. By the time you get to what you were talking about with Constantine and the, the formation of the First Council of Nicaea, the, the, you know the number one debate at the First Council of Nicaea what. It wasn't just the Arian controversy. Mm -hmm. They had a whole nother debate for days over the celebration of Easter and whether or not they should celebrate this holiday, Passover, Pesach. Should they celebrate it on the traditional calendar of the Jews that we've done it on the 354 day lunar calendar all these years? Should we switch it to the solar calendar? And when Constantine offers his, his object, he says, uh, uh, Eusebius says that the, the bishops were evenly split over the issue. And Constantine interjects and he says, we have it in our power at this council to prolong to future generations a new order, a, a newer tradition wow. that will forever distance us from the days of those. Well, I, I won't use all the words he uses, but he calls the Jews some pretty terrible things. Wow. And this also relates to baptism. Why Why get rid of the name of Jesus and baptism? Jesus is a very Jewish name. Yes. And the idea of a Christian church that baptizes in the name of a Jewish rabbi, well, that doesn't sit very well with at least... The parts of the Roman Empire that despise Israel and despise the traditions of the Jews, that comes out later in, in, um, uh, the writings of, um, we talked about him last year, uh, mm -hmm. Chrysostom, uh, against, yes. against Judaism and Christians. That, that tractate, it comes out there too. They wanted to distance themselves from a quote unquote Jewish Christianity. And that necessarily required them to change the water baptismal formula. The theology of the Trinity was kind of happening separately. That, that's why these two things are so disconnected. That's why there's Catholic bishops that endorse Jesus' name baptism throughout history yeah. until a certain year. But the doctrine of the Trinity kind of goes through all these facelifts and changes. Yeah. That has a whole other, there, there's a whole other reason for that. So the name, the Semitism and anti-Semitism comes um, from the word Shem. Yes. So, and the word Shem, the name Shem, means name. Yeah. Literally, they are the people of the name. So, in the apostolic world, we are we are proponents of the name of Jesus. In Revelation, Jesus says to several of the churches, you have held fast to my name. You have not denied my name. There's this emphasis on the name. And a lot of Trinitarian theologians try to say that name, uh, or nomo, does not just mean you know, the actual oral invocation of the name, but that it means the authority of, or by the power of. Um, but the scripture talks about people who name the name of Jesus Christ, and anyone that nameth the name of Christ, um, or his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. So the oral invocation of the name of Jesus is a very, very original, organic, apostolic idea to eliminate that from baptism is to create, as you said, look at these things that are emerging. It creates distancing from the original Jewish Christian community. It creates a new order. For, and he's very aware it's going to be for generations to come. He's creating a Roman construct or a Roman Catholic universal church that is going to be a completely different thing going forward, which is what we've contended for so many years. And... Constantine, I don't think people are aware that his codifying of that, his putting that into stone, as it were, it created so much of the conflict that we have today. Bible purists, Bible originalists are going to insist on going to the book of Acts. But to overturn that ancient paradigm that Constantine put in place and overturn traditions, people are very resistant to it. They don't care what the Bible says at the end of the day. That's exactly right. Is that, you know, Trinitarian... The, one of the worst mistakes you can make is just generally assuming that all Trinitarian thinkers care that it's not strictly speaking original to the Bible. They, yeah. they don't because they, yeah. they actually hold the, the councils and the creeds and the, the church fathers. They, they hold them in high regard. You know, Constantine, it wasn't, it's funny, it wasn't just Easter, it wasn't just baptism, it wasn't just, you know, the Godhead. 
Constantine, th- this is when he sends, so he sends his mother back into, into Jerusalem, uh, Helena. He sends her back in and begins to redraw the map, declaring new holy sites. And it was for the same reason. Go back and read his letter that he writes to his mother. It's to create new holy sites for a new Christian tradition that it can be distanced from the Jewish tradition. This is why the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is nowhere near Golgotha. This is why uh, his the, the church that's in, if you go to Jerusalem today, in, in, uh, or excuse me, if you, go to, if you go to Israel today and you go to Bethlehem, mm-hmm. of course the Church of the Nativity is not where Jesus was born. That's not the point. It was about creating... Constantine, to his credit, he knew the power of storytelling. Mm. He knew that they needed. He knew that they needed a history, a shared tradition, but it had to be a shared tradition that distanced them from these, like as you said, Semitic of the name. Anti-Semitic would be against the name. Against the know? name, the original anti-name yeah. dynamic. There, it's the yeah, original it isogenic exactly. rebellion. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Arch of Constantine has it has in hieroglyphs and carvings it has um i think it's poseidon it has oh yeah 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 i have a picture of it in my book yeah it's, that yeah. blew my mind because i've been to the arch uh, but you can't get close enough to see all that but you bring out that point tell the tell the audience about that yeah so constant one of the biggest um this this is helpful for if you're doing a bible study with protestant people or catholic people generally is just reminding them if they don't know constantine was never a christian he was not a christian but, you know, he was sympathetic to them um, in, in the sense that, and there, I won't go into the whole history, but Con, first of all, Constantine was not the one that liberated Christian worship. That, that happened under Galerius, his, his predecessor. Constantine was a bit of a weather vane. He, he, knew, he knew that the empire had no more stomach for persecution. And so it was very much if he can't beat them, join them mentality. The issue is, what do you do with all of the pagans? Well, the pagans are going to be more open to the idea of a universal christian religion than the christians are to a universal pagan religion because in the pagan mind it's not that un- it's not that unreasonable to say that the god of the christians has defeated our gods in in pagan culture the gods are not all powerful they're not omnipresent they're, they're not omnipresent. they're humans writ large yeah and so it so it made sense for them that we can reframe our pagan past with a, a christian face and so add to your point constantine's arch not just his arch, but the coins that he had minted in this time still venerate the sun, the Sol Invictus. Uh, you know, during this time, he has the uh, at his pillar at Constantinople, uh, which uh, the, the top of it's broken off today. But if you see the original, it's it's him standing in the nude with the orb and scepter, yeah. you know, of Jupiter. And then the arch, the arch has um, it's interesting that he included he included battle scenes. And the gods of the Antonine emperors, which he was not a part of. He was not a, he was not a part of. Um, of the the generation of Marcus Aurelius, and he, you know, and and he, he, he mourned also, that, didn't he? Didn't he want to be a part of that, or yeah, this was his he, way of he like? Saw, it goes back to storytelling, you know. He understood that who I'm, you know, synonym, and he wasn't the first one to do this. Creating a, a fake ancestor was pretty common at the time. Yeah, but he synonymizes himself with the greats, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Hadrian the Greek, because he was a Greek revivalist. Uh, Marcus Aurelius the wise. And these sacrifices that are made to the various idols that they worship. Actually, you were talking about you can't get close enough to see it today. There was a journalist who I found a, I found a, a, some writings that he had done. Actually, he teaches. I, I had correspondence with him for a while. He teaches at Cornell. He's their professor of history and classics there. And he actually had the opportunity to, to go and, and stand underneath the arch. And if you look straight up into wow. the dead center of the arch... There's a statue of the sun god <laughs> wow. that Constantine worshipped. Okay, so and, didn't didn't there used to be a massive statue right next to that? It's been removed since, but yeah, it used yeah. to, had his hand on it, and there was this yeah. huge display. It was supposed to be Constantine. Yeah, <laughs> those arches. So those arches were kind of similar to like today's presidential libraries. They were pretty. Con- you built them after uh, great epics or great emperors, and it would commemorate their history. It was commemorating their legacy yeah. as an emperor. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, and for him, that was a very pagan past. Well, okay. So here's a question: Why do secular historians have no problem pointing that out, but when it comes to theologians, they want to whitewash that and they want to. You know, Fred Astaire tap dance past that because they don't want to admit that Constantine was this pagan who just hijacked Christianity. The irony is because secular historians don't need Constantine and theological historians think that they do. Now, they don't. <laughs> they don't, but they think they do. They, yeah. they think that they need him to validate the Christianization of the world. In reality, secular historians, you know, they 
they of course they don't have a dog in the fight. Their yeah. their idea is just you know we're just gonna you know hey he he had his wife killed he had his son killed like you know he had his best friends murdered. Oh, I mean they, don't care. they just lay you it know? all out there. Yeah, and so for for that's another reason I wrote the book was to give apostolic uh, readers and really any reader I guess uh, I got an interesting story about a, a good Baptist professor here in a minute that I'll, I'll share with you but um, I want to give them the opportunity to reframe their Christian past is that you know you're. The, we don't have to look at the the church fathers, quote unquote. We don't have to look at Constantine. It's the truth of the matter is is that there have been, and uh, uh, Brother Marvin Arnold did a lot of good work in his day trying to carve out some of this. Yeah. But there were there there were a lot of people anathematized by the Catholic Church that oh, I certainly wouldn't say that we would agree or, or see eye to eye with them on everything, but they were they were opposers to the Catholic Church and the mm-hmm. Catholic way of, of, of doing things. And to the idea that they were fringe or that they were a small minority is just not true. When when you get to the the council of the uh, first council of Constantinople in 381, when Theodosius finally codifies the modern doctrine of the Trinity, that I, I had been told for years that we could not find evidence of oneness thinkers mm-hmm. present at these councils or that they were uh that they were not specifically mentioned um i uh i, I do have in the book that Eng- there's an english rendering of the seventh canon of the first council of constantinople and then the seventh canon it's, it's very interesting the emperor declares the arians do not need to be rebaptized if they want entry into the catholic church the donatists do not have to be rebaptized but he names another group that he synonymizes with the monarchians. He says, but these Sibelians, mm. if they want entry into the Catholic Church, they must be rebaptized in this formula, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And again, it's just further evidence that this was not a settled issue in the fourth century. It yeah. was, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity was not, it was not ubiquitous. Doesn't Tertullian even make the statement? I, I, I want to say, is it was, is what him, it was it him, him that wrote against Praxius? Was it Tertullian? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Didn't he say in there that Sibelius has more followers that are everywhere? The common man, the layman yeah. is seduced by Sibelius and we have to educate them into the, <laughs> For, for you know, it's, paraphrasing. it's ironic that he said that because Tertullian was excommunicated and Sibelius wasn't. Sibelius <laughs> pastored. Sibelius pastored like till the end of his life and uh, around Egypt. Trip. And so it's just funny that um, you know you look at modern historian church historians. They they lean so hard on Eusebius and these church historians that they think again they're necessary. But when you read their writings, what you find is that well they're really only necessary for one particular framework and and I know that a common objection is that well why didn't the doctrine of the trinity disappear during the protestant reformation all these other reforms are happening you have martin luther opposing the sale of indulgences you have john calvin you know on on uh you know uh, etern- on on eternal security and mm-hmm. and predestination of the soul and things why why did the doctrine of the trinity stay and the truth is the doctrine of the trinity didn't stay it was opposed in the Protestant Reformation, just like every other doctrine of the Catholic Church. The difference was is that when it was opposed, those the advocates of that doctrine they were gagged and executed. That that did happen. Michael Cerritos. You know, yeah, exactly. And people forget he was he was uh, a partner with with Calvin and Luther. You know, he was he was on I would say on the same level, but really above in many ways. He Luther was. and Calvin; these were his uh, peers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Servetus, he, he was a guy that had, uh, you know, big education. You know, he had, he was, a uh, he was certainly not a nobody. Mm-hmm. He, he was, he served with, um, he, he, the, the friar that trained him was a confessor to Charles V. He was at the coronation of Charles V. Wow. Um, and he saw that the, the gaudiness of the Catholic Church and the worship of the Pope, he, he withdraws and he originally planned on just studying law. And he he didn't really have any interest, but theology comes back around in his twenties. He starts studying this, and he writes uh, two treatises on the Trinity against uh, on errors of the Trinity, and uh, eventually, of course, is is vilified for it. He's he's executed by John Calvin uh, in Geneva. You can actually go see today. There's a statue on the site of his execution. If you go to Geneva. Uh, like in the 1970s, the Calvinist church, Presbyterian church, they finally apologized for what happened to Michael Servetus. And in the 1970s, they had this statue built where he was burned at the stake. Wow. And uh, it's just interesting because his his work was being it was being distributed. They did see him as a threat. That's why they had him executed. The difference was is that while Luther's papers were preserved and Calvin's papers were preserved, at his execution, Michael Servetus, his papers were thrown in the fire. Only uh, three or four of his three. books remain. Yeah, Christianismi Restitutio. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and, and by the way, again, the idea that this was fringy, it's just not true. Harvard University still uses the works of Michael Servitt. Yeah. In fact, if you're going to buy his works today, if you're going to buy the English translations of his works, buy them from Harvard Divinity School. They still, they still use his stuff. Um, the Harvard Medical School uh, still uses his research on uh, the circula- pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary circulation. Yeah. Yeah. And he, uh, he was not a fringe thinker. This was a, he was a, a you know, a, a very influential man in his time. They try to marginalize him as this wild eyed, wild haired heretic. Uh, and they did the same thing to Sibelius. You know, what, what, what is a, a logical conundrum for them? And they don't like this publicized is how can there be so many works against Sibelius? How can there be such a volume of refutation of his doctrine? How can he be so influential with, the majority of Christendom, and not one work survive. How's that possible? Well, because you know history is written by the victors. It's you know, written by and, the victors, brother. You know, there there's a lot of you know. Thankfully, modern archaeology and and modern research with which really in in large part began with the the last of, the, of papal Rome as papal Rome began to fall. Uh, research opportunities opened up for a lot of this stuff, but. Um, you know, whether Sibelius or Servetus, whatever, the, the, the principle for me is, it, and it goes, again, I, I do like what you said about, um, you said that they like to paint him as like this wild haired yeah. kind of fringy thinker. You know, I've heard that about Michael Servetus from apostolic people in Pentecost. They say, well, but he was, he was a little out there. I don't, I'm almost positive people who say that haven't read his work. They read the not. English translations. <laughs> the brilliant. Only thing, yeah. The only thing that I've read of his that I was kind of, eh was he does have some, not I wouldn't say strange, but they're hard to discern beliefs about. It looks like he has some strange beliefs about angels. Mm. At one time, he calls uh, he calls the Holy Ghost an angel of God. Mm-hmm. But if you put it in the time that he's writing, 15th century, 16th century English, you understand how that terminology was used? Yeah. It's not, number one, it's not rare. It's very It was a very common way to speak of the Holy Ghost as the messenger of God. Um, but number two, it's, it's so minor in his writings. Like so much of his writing is very good. It's, it's, it's the stuff that we say. It's, you know, it's, it's he that has seen me has seen the father. How say is yeah. show us the father. It's don't be drawn into philosophy, the vain deceitfulness of men's philosophy. Colossians For in him dwelleth too. all the fullness yeah. of the Godhead. He's using the same stuff that we use today. Well, what shocked me about some of his writings, I haven't written, or I haven't read a lot of them, but I have read enough of them to be impressed. Um, one of the things that struck me, particularly his, his responses to Calvin, he was abrasive, man. Um, mm-hmm. Servetus was, he would just go for the jugular and just plow through. I mean, there was no backup in him. And that's probably why they hated him to some yeah, degree. Like, well, and Calvin, <laughs> people forget too, is that Calvin, so Calvin never apologized for having him executed. You can, I have a, from, from the German, I have an English translation from the German of Calvin's uh, justification for burning Calvin or for burning Servetus. What's funny about it is people forget that it was what happened to Michael Servetus that sent the Protestant Reformation. It was the first domino that fell in reforming the Protestant church to end uh, all of the uh, inquisitions and execution for heresy. So execution for heresy existed in the Catholic church and in the Protestant church. And in the Protestant church, yeah. It stops after Servetus. And what's funny about it is that if you read Again, like putting all things in perspective in that time period, it was because of what happened to Servetus. The people demanded uh, Calvin's resignation. He was he was no he was not the Prince of Geneva. After that, he falls out of favor with the people. But also, you find connections between what happened to him and the justification for sending colonizers to North America to start uh, the to start the Quaker colonies and to start the I uh, the colonies of Jamestown and Plymouth. And the reason being is because read um, William Penn's read William Penn's No Cross No Crown. Wow! In that book, I'm he this says uh, William Penn says in that book that it is not just the Catholic Church, but it is the institutional Protestant Church that is bringing persecution. It, he he speaks against the Church of England. He speaks against um, uh, in in that time what's going on with the Lutheran movement. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't just the Catholics. There was also this desire to get away from the extremes of the Protestant movement as well. And so, yeah, yeah, No Cross, No Crown by William Penn. That's a really fascinating insight into why why he sympathized with the Quakers and why uh, why Delaware and Pennsylvania even became a state. Okay. We got to grab a hold of that right there. You are drawing a correlation 
between the death of Michael Servetus, John Calvin's overarching persecution of Servetus, which, which angered people, to the founding of the United States of America. Yeah, and, and at least in some of the colonies. You know, it's, it's, That's you mind-boggling. Know, North, yeah, it is. And, you know, North America, people forget, like, those 13 original colonies, so many of them began as religious colonies. There's a re- you know, Maryland is named Maryland because it was the only safe haven for Catholics in North America. You know, it's Mary Land. That's where that yeah. comes from. Yeah. Uh, Virginia was named, well, <laughs> Virginia was named in honor of Queen Elizabeth's virginity, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, Delaware and Pennsylvania, the Quakers, and then you have, you go up to New York and you've got the Church of England. And, and so, you know, th- that, that desire to whatever Michael Servetus had inside of him, that desire to see it live on and to see it exist in perpetuity, that has its connection specifically to, uh, to North America, to Delaware and Pennsylvania. There, there is a connection between. That should be uh, your next those- book, man. That right there should be your next book. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating stuff for sure. You know, there's, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that when you can, when you can show people, I don't, I don't personally think it's difficult to show Trinitarian thinkers that the doctrine of the Trinity principally has its roots in, in Greek thought in, in Greek philosophy. And also, but, but if you can frame it around, it's not just about what it's for, but it's about what they stood against that I'm uncomfortable with. Yeah. I don't want to be attached to a movement that was, that was synonymized with anti-Semitism. I don't want to be wow. attached to a movement that, that dejected water baptism in Jesus name because he was a Jewish rabbi. I, I don't, um, if you read Constantine's letter when he con- he convened the Council of, of Rome and the Council of Arles, 313, 314, which gave him the, that, that, those were the councils that gave him power over the, the Catholic movement specifically. Yeah. This was giving, for the first time, a political leader institutional legitimacy in the church. And he writes in the, in those letters, uh, talking about the, uh, the different churches that existed in the empire. He said, number one, he said he thought the debates over oneness in the Trinity were frivolous. And then number two, he says, I don't understand it. He said, all the churches in the North, in the West, and in the South, they all, we can find favor with bishops in all three of those regions. But the bishops of the East, and he specifically mentions Diocese Orientis, he said they are not willing to capitulate. Well, what, what is that region? That's Southern Syria, that's Israel, that's Northern Egypt. That wow. whole area is, that's the resistance. <laughs> Uh, sell to the doctrine of the Trinity. And it's like, it's there. It's, it's, the, it's like, the Semitic people. Yeah. And they're saying, no, this is not from Jerusalem. This is not what Jesus taught. This is, you are hijacking. Yeah, exactly right. Well, uh, it's the, the syncretic roots of this. This is, there's a syncretism here uh, between um, the Greco Roman dynamic, the machines coming in, it's Hellenizing everything in its path. It creates a totally new hybrid monster. When Daniel records this Holy Roman Empire rising, it's a beast that's unlike any before them. All the nations before them, you know, they are certain beasts, but there's one beast that is an, it's, it's a conglomerate of all the beasts. And there's a horn in the middle that speaks great swelling words against the Almighty and blasphemies. And this Holy Roman Empire that rose up would crush the world for thousands of years uh or at least over a thousand years and um the world has to know this with with all the things that are happening in the modern day society as education grows as people are overturning things a postmodern generation is re-examining things in the past that they assumed were true um now this has to be toppled the trend the doctrine of the trinity is not core to christianity it is one of the greatest hindrances to Christianity, and the fact that you have documented this and shown these pre-Christian roots, this is, it's a great book. Um, I want to take a moment, I want to give our readers a chance to find out where this is at. So, I think the easiest place to get this is at Amazon. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. So, they go to Amazon and they type in... Uh, they can just they can type in my name if they want. It's uh, just Stephen Gill, S T E V E N. Um, the book, the history and development of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, you can type in that title as well. I think. Okay. Give yeah, me a show them a copy of it if you got it there. I do have a copy here. This is what it'll look like. Yeah. Um, uh, you asked earlier about um, reactions to the book, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on yeah, it. Yeah, tell I will me. Say that the, well, I will say that okay. So the cover, I had a, a good friend of mine, uh, Brother Jordan Fry, uh, who's our pastoral assistant in our church, very gifted in, in graphic design and things like that. Um, 
we put together and then, and then the, the spine, you know, the sun SPQR and the symbol of philosophy. So when we were putting together the cover, um, we had some, I had many, many, uh, opportunities to engage with apostolic people over the content of the book because just looking at the cover, it's so provocative to oneness people. I had a, I had a woman actually at that conference that you and I were talking about last year in Sacramento, yeah. a woman uh, who came up to me and asked, if I had the symbol of the Trinity on my Bible, she thought it was my Bible, I guess. And she was very taken aback. And she was like, are you a Trinitarian? And it, it was just hilarious to me because that's the response. I had a, a pastor friend of mine in Knoxville who messaged me and said, hey, I was promoting your book on my Facebook. And somebody actually asked me, is is Stephen charismatic? Did he go, is he like with the Trinitarian now? Because they saw the book and they just, you know, so I love it. It's very, it's a very provocative yeah. uh, book cover. I told Jordan, he just nailed it because it's, it, it is, uh, and on the flip side of that, I had um, going back to that guy I told you about, that professor at Liberty. Um, there is a um, professor at Liberty University that um, uh, bought my book, I guess, on Amazon, and uh, he had written a review about it. And he said, he said, well, when I bought it, based I guess based on the looks, he was under the impression that this was a book that was going to, you know, be very, uh, you know. Very uh, sympathetic to his own notions about yeah. Doctor Strange. He said, yeah. "Well, I read the book, and clearly this is a this is a oneness person who wrote it." And he he said, "Nevertheless, he said I, I do appreciate the content of the book, and I, you know he thought it was you know well put together, which I appreciated. But but it was funny because his 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 reason for buying it was for the same reason why apostolic people might you know avoid yeah. it. So I, I thought that was great. Um, that's awesome. So yeah, that is, that's where to get the book, Amazon. That's wonderful." That is wonderful. Well, I, I encourage our audience to take the time to go out and buy it. You will be greatly enriched by it. But the Gill is a is a breath of fresh air into the discussion of oneness and Trinitarianism. Um, just the fact that you are citing original source material, you are uh, digging up uh, the quotes and context and the different councils and the different meetings and the correspondence between the major players of that time. It's something that may sound arcane or old or ancient or irrelevant today, but it is not. It is a part of the framework. And if you are going to be a part of the original Book of Acts church, which means having the original Book of Acts revival, then you need to know this and you need to know what you believe and why you believe it. Yeah. Real quick before... Uh before we wrap it up here, I got to get your thoughts on this. So you mentioned Daniel talking about the, the Roman Empire and, you know, and of course we read Revelation and so much synonymism between the great whore of Babylon and mm-hmm. things like that. Here's my question. So Rome is called the city of seven hills. Yeah. Turkey is also called the city of seven hills. And the first council of Constantinople, of course, happens in Turkey, the do- codification of the Doctrine of the Trinity. Mm. And today, if you look at the relationship between, you know, what is Turkey today? What is Rome today? They're both called the City of Seven Hills. The si- the Seven Hills in Turkey are named after the Seven Hills in Rome. Wow. Um, so here's my question. The debate between, is it Islam? Is it Catholicism? Both have cities of seven hills. <laughs> both have both have roots in false doctrine with yeah. the Christian church specifically. Wait, give me your, give me your thoughts. <laughs> okay, so people want to make the Revelation seventeen woman Catholicism, and and I think certainly you can make a case that that's part of it, but I think it's just a part. I think that she is actually false, the false bride. She is the false woman, which is false doctrine. It's a it's a counterfeit. So I would call it false religion. I would call it well exactly what it is: mystery, Babylon. The mother of harlots. If you take that typology back into the Old Testament, the harlot was actually apostate uh, Judaism. There was there was God's faithful bride that he saw arising, and then there was Israel who was unfaithful to him. And Jerusalem that now is, you know, from the book of Galatians that Paul describes, Jerusalem that now is, is Hagar, and she is um, she is in captivity. You've got to cast out the bondwoman, Hagar, and her son. And Jerusalem, which is above, is the which is the mother of all. She's the mother of us all. She's free. So I think the bondwoman is any ideology that is masquerading as God's covenant people, and I think it encapsulates both of them. That's good. Yeah, I I, I can definitely I can definitely see that. I'm I'm I've gotten really interested, and we could talk about this maybe some other time. I've gotten really uh, interested as of late in um, Arab history, understanding the. Uh, the Arab world um, before, uh, certainly before Islam, and obviously after Islam, and uh, you know what what it's created today. There's a the, one of the gentlemen that helped me publish this book, the History and Development. 
Um, we are uh, hopefully soon going to be working together on a book on the uh, the history of the the, uh, uh, the Jewish Palestinian conflict and uh, wow. understanding it for, for for Apostolic Pentecostals, framing the uh, the the, uh, the issues uh, for them, both in ancient history and also in modernity, helping them understand you know what's what's going on. So yeah, it's fascinating. I enjoy that. I love that. Um, one little thing I'd like to ask you. I'm, I may have alluded to this previously. One of my dreams, one of my fantasies, would be to find. First of all, I got to learn Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to find some of those old Islamic libraries that preserved so much literature um, during the Dark Ages, during the Golden Age of the Islamic uh, Renaissance, 1000, 1100. I just wonder if some of Sibelius' work survived. I wonder if, right. as you know, Ignatius Loyola and Calvin and all these were, were binding books and burning them and eliminating, you know, history is written by the victors. Um, was there some Muslim cleric that found a, a, a Sabellian book and squirreled it away somewhere? I, I would love to read some authentic writings. And to this date, there's been none. And you mentioned Brother Chalfant earlier. Brother Chalfant is a champion of Sibelius. Um, mm -hmm. He's written a couple books where he's kind of fictionalized Sibelius and what, what, what it could have been and, and how what little we do know, he's kind of cobbled it together. Um, man, I want to find some library somewhere back buried in, yeah. I don't know, Kabul or it's, Baghdad. It's interesting because when you, when you read what was happening in those regions of the world before Islam, you know, even, and I do talk a little bit in my book about um, why, why were the Persians and the Jews, um, why, was there, why did there seem to be peace there? But when the Greeks come in and they oppose the Persians, the Jews are not quick to help the Greeks uh, mm. oppose Darius the Third, and we know biblically some of that is, of course, because it was Cyrus the Great that mm -hmm. that releases them back to to do what they will. And Darius, of course, is a, looked on fondly in Old Testament literature. Yeah. Um, but the the religion of that region it does change. You know, is it the Persian? What is the Persian Empire? You know, back then, modern Iran, Iran, Iraq, whatever. Um, when Islam comes in, and so much of that was Zoroastrian and, and Mazenianism mm -hmm. and things like that, which there there is some questions about where did they get that? This, where did ethical monotheism come from if they weren't Jews? And yeah. so when there's some questions we can ask about the Ark and whatever. But when you get to Islam, to your point about could we find writings that you know that 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 maybe the the Ottoman Empire preserved? I I don't know. I would say that I I would be. Um, I would be more inclined to believe that they preserved writings than I would the Catholic Church, yeah. mainly because in the Ottoman Empire there were very there were parts of Christianity that at least found tolerance. Yeah, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, Catholicism not so much. They they were quick to uh, destroy the works of heretics, you know. And yeah. so I, I, that'd be very interesting. I I would I think that so much of the history we need is at the moment in a country that it's very difficult to travel to and do archaeology in, which is Iran. Uh, Iran, mm. You know, it's very, there's so much that we need to do there. Yeah. So much of the history of the church. I so would love the history it. Of the Jews. Um, there was such a large Jewish community in, in uh, Iran before, uh, well, before the revolution, you know, yeah. before uh, the 1970s, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that would just be fascinating to be able to go in and, and see uh, the history that's that's locked up in their land. Of course, that's very difficult at the moment. Did you read about that recent discovery a couple of days ago where they made public over in Iraq about the Sumerian city that they uncovered? No. Yeah, for like the last seven that's days. Right. Yeah, the British Museum, they just announced that it's a huge deal. It was a collaboration. Um, wow. And so they're they're excavating it. They've excavated, excavated enough and spent enough money to where they can make it public now. Um, but the guys who did it were largely funded by the British Museum. <clears throat> And it was Sumerian, and uh, it's in Iraq. And it got me going back into my old college days. And, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh is supposed to be the oldest known writing from that period. Do you know what the boatman that took Gilgamesh across the river, do you know what his name was? I don't. Um, I think G Gilgamesh was with Enkidu and um, Nbidi or... I can't remember the names, but those were the little gods he was in, in the legend. Well, the boatman, the ferryman, who carried him across the river was Urshan Abi. 
Wow. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and I went, ah, there we are. We're right there. <laughs> well, you, you have a... Uh, uh, that your family is Persian, right? If I'm not mistaken, we are. Yeah. We're actually Azerbaijani, a Syrian, and it was the Azerbaijan province of Iran, and um, it's not too far from um, the the big lake up there, um, Ermu. No, not Ermu. Uh, Uruk. It's, it's one of the big Ermia, Ermia, Lake Ermia. Um. So yeah, I, I was recently in. Beirut, and I preached to uh, several people that were part of the Assyrian genocide of the early 1900s, and man, the Holy Ghost broke out in that service in a powerful way, because they identified with the suffering of the Urshan family that was a Middle Eastern dynamic, so there's a connection there that I, I don't know, that, but that one day God might give us a chance to to reach in there and hopefully get in some of those libraries and find something. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm with you if I go, that. if I go, you want to come with me? Hey, let's go. I'm, I'm down. We'll have to get the Navy SEALs to go with us just to make sure we come <laughs> yeah, back, right? Same. We'll call up some... Yeah, but... <laughs> well, cool. Well, man, Brother Gil, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the time to come on Biblos and to share your thoughts and your perspectives. Thank you very much, Brother. I enjoyed it.